I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. The submarines of the 21st century are major weapon systems, and to follow, they are the major security system for the United States of America, the silent service, especially those boomers, the missile boats that cannot be found, guaranteeing that the United States will counter any sneak attack. Once upon a time, however, the idea of a submarine being dangerous to anything on land or on water was so novel that there was no preparation for it. We go immediately to 1776, which is when the submarine uh, as an aggressor is born and when anti-submarine warfare first gets a conversation. A new book, Hunters and Killers. This is volume one of anti-submarine warfare from 1776 to 1943. Edward Whitman is with me. He and his colleague Norman Palmar published, published published this. There'll be a volume two for the post Cold War, post war and Cold War period. We have to do some fundamentals because we're inventing the language that now in the 21st century is routine for Hollywood moviegoers. Ed, congratulations to you and Norman. A very good evening to you. Here we are, September 1776. The Turtle, piloted by Ezra Lee, approaching. The warship, the flagships, the 64-gun flagship Eagle in New York Harbor, where the Statue of Liberty now sits. What is Eagle? What's its aim? Who built this? How did they imagine sinking a warship? Good evening to you. Well, good evening. Uh, David Bushnell was a a Yale graduate. He was a a a Connecticut patriot. And uh, he conceived the idea of building a crude submersible that could attack the ships that were uh, then, the British ships, then sheltering in New York Harbor. And he, um, he came up with a very clever design for the time. It was a one-man, hand-propelled uh, submarine that could uh, submerge completely. It was intended to attack the enemy ship by... Um, uh, using an auger to screw into the wooden hull and then affixing a mine with a, a clockwork detonator and then withdrawing and waiting for the ship to blow up. As luck would have it, he came up underneath the metal rudder fittings and was trying to drill into iron. And so he uh, he abandoned the attempt, and even though he was uh, detected during his retreat and chased, he managed to escape and preserve the uh, the, the turtle. At any event, this attempt really panicked the British, and, and they instituted what might be called the first ASW, anti-submarine warfare, measures, which consisted largely of moving their fleet up the Hudson River, where it would be less accessible to uh, undersea craft from American-held territory. Um, and that's, uh, as we think, was the first uh, serious attempt to sink uh, a warship uh, uh, using a submarine as, as, as far back as 1770. In other words, submarines attacking ships and ships defending themselves from submarines are as old as the United States of America. It was born with the U.S. And so we go immediately to the second American Revolution when the Confederates put together an attempt. Remember, the Union blockade strangled the South, cut off all of its ability to do commerce and to exchange money, to get money from Europe, also to be resupplied by Europe. So in Mobile Bay, uh, the Brit- uh, the uh, Union fleet was dominant, and the Confederates put together a several craft, but the one that's first successful is Hunley. Although when I say successful, Ed, I have to be careful here. I counted three crews that were destroyed by Hunley before or maybe while it destroyed Housatonic. They found Hunley. Where did they find it? In Charleston Harbor, uh, quite far from the point where um, the Housatonic was actually sunk. Uh, for many years, it was believed that the Hunley had been blown up in the same explosion that took down the Housatonic. But now we think that uh, it, it somehow foundered on its way back to uh, to its home base. We don't know how or why. But in fact, as you say, the ship has been the uh, submarine has been found, uh, raised, uh, dewatered, and now that they're now preserving it uh, um, uh, for a museum expedition. Or it killed two crews, including its inventor, before it was transported by train from Mobile Bay over to Charleston. In other words, you can you can picture this: the Civil War is going on, the Confederates are arriving, riding around, being romantic. The Union is grinding out. It's 1863. 
This is about, uh, this is 1864. This is after Gettysburg, but before the worst of the fighting is going to come in the summer of 64. And this craft, there's a picture in Ed's book. This craft looks like a mini submarine. It's got, uh, it's, uh, they've conceived everything will eventually be a submarine fleet, Ed. I'm, I'm just surprised by the design, given that it started as a round little bobbing egg in 1776. Here by 1864, they have what you'd have to say is a mini sub. Well, the Confederates, in fact, uh, tried about six different uh, experimental uh, submarine designs. Different different people all over the South uh, were intrigued by the challenge of attacking the Union fleet. Uh, and the Hundley was only the most successful. Well, successful, I guess, in the sense that it it, it did sink a warship, but uh, it, it fears some cost to its own, uh, its own personnel. Anti-submarine warfare is in the future because the whole idea of using the submarine as an offensive weapon is striking. We go now to American inventors. There are several along the way. You're all thinking of Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I learned from Ed and Norman that that's inspirational for people who will eventually become either submariners or designers of the submarine. A man by the name of John Holland. He is an Irish-American school teacher. He emigrates to the United States, and he starts building submarines. First, a 14-foot submarine off of, in the Passaic River. He's here at New York. And then a, uh, a 31-footer, and that's in New York Harbor. They call the Fenian Ram. Why is he doing this? What does he want done with his inventions, Ed? Well, actually, the, the Fenian Ram was, uh, was funded by... Um an Irish uh, patriotic organization that was dedicated to the defeat of the British Empire. And they had what was called a skirmishing fund, which I guess was intended to buy arms and and ammunition for anti-British uh, uh, forces. And they, they uh, were convinced by John Holland that, that he could design a submarine that would be successful in attacking the British fleet. And they funded his uh, his earliest attempts. They built the Fenian Ram, and which was quite successful. And uh, it, it it ran around New York Harbor for a year or two, and uh, with Holland continually uh, improving it. Do we still and, have it, Ed? Does it still exist no, anywhere? No, 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 it, it, no. What happened was, uh, as I recall, there was a some kind of a falling out among the members of the, the Fenian Society, and one one what a surprise one um, uh, faction uh, hijacked it and took it to I think it was New Haven Harbor, and it was somehow lost there. So we'll go searching for Fenian Rams soon enough. Now, the development will continue between the 1870s, 1880s, and the First War. But a note here, the U.S. Congress gets involved very early. $200,000 for a submarine competition in 1893. Uh, Holland participated uh, with the Holland Torpedo Boat Company. What I want to get to is when Holland teams up, he builds a 75-footer, Holland, the Holland 6. He teams up with Isaac Rice, a German-American businessman, and that's where Electric Boat Company comes from. I, I never knew that its origins were thanks to the investment by the U.S. Congress. So once upon a time, Ed, the Congress believed in the Navy and gave it the money it needed. Yes, uh, I, I don't think they knew that what they were getting into. And, I'm not, and the Navy was rather half-hearted about it also. I, I think they saw uh, comparable developments going on in Europe and felt that they ought to uh, uh, get a hand in Interestingly enough, Isaac Rice was a businessman who originally sold batteries. That was his business, and he saw the potential for using batteries in the submarine business, and Holland had all these ideas for submarines, and that's why they teamed up. The British and French and Russians, everybody's watching submarine development because these infernal machines, uh, they've all read Jules Verne by this time. Everybody knows about Nemo. So we come to the idea that we're going to control the threat of submarines with the 1909 Declaration of London. What were they trying to do, Ed? Did they regard the submarine as unstoppable? Is that why they were coming up with rules? Well, the, uh, the Declaration of London resulted from a conference which in turn grew out of an earlier uh, Hague conference, which somehow had neglected to um, uh, codify the uh, uh, rules of war at sea. And it was felt necessary, uh, not so much because there were submarines, but other warships that might, in fact, be attacking or seeking to capture um, enemy or neutral merchant ships. And, and they, it was felt they needed some rules of war 
uh, commensurate with those that protect neutrals in, in land warfare. And it was intended to, to provide a framework within which uh, navies could, could legally search and, if necessary, seize enemy contraband without putting um, the passengers and crew of ships in danger. These became known as the prize regulations. So these correct, gentlemen yes. were, gra- were drawing up rules to apply to what we know now to be the catastrophe of the first war that's ahead of us. The book is Hunters and Killers. Anti-submarine warfare from 1776 to 1943. Norman Palmer and Edward Whitman are the authors. When we come back, World War I and, of course, Darkness Visible. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Ed Whitman is with me. He and his colleague Norman Palmer have published Hunters and Killers. This is anti-submarine warfare. The idea of fighting submarines comes pretty much at the same time as the threat of submarines. We've tried finding them or searching them out or keeping watch for them. That's the 18th and 19th century. But now we are in the early 20th century. The submarine fleets, all the competition for naval supremacy with the UK continues, including building submarine fleets, but they are trying the prize regulations. They're trying rules. And right away, the rules come into question because we go to the first merchant sinking, 20 October 1914. Very early. The war started in August. And at this point, I'd say that the German commander of the U-boat, U-17, does follow something you'd have to call rules because he doesn't seek to sink the, sh- the merchant ship and kill everybody on board. So he follows the prize regulations, and it looks like it doesn't unseat everybody right away. Although, Ed, when I read this, I thought to myself, what are they thinking? Do they really think that this war is just going to be over by Christmas and they're all going to be uh, drinking at the same table as their adversaries again? It's a very peculiar word, world just uh, 100 years ago. Well, yes. I mean, it's, it wasn't only in, in naval warfare, but it, it was anticipated the land warfare would be over by Christmas, you know. And uh, you know, of course, they were sadly mistaken. It went on for for four years, and, and you know, and kind of destroyed Western civilization in a very real sense. But uh, at least initially, uh, the German Navy sought to uh, to abide by the by the prize rules, and uh, the, the the problem was that that the submarines weren't very effective in. Um, in, in seizing merchant ships under those conditions. It, it, it required them to come to the surface where they were most vulnerable and spend a lot of time um, uh, searching and, uh, and, and scanning documents on the proposed victim ship. And they didn't have and, a deck gun at that moment either, these submarines. No, no, they didn't, they didn't have a deck gun early in the game. Um, eventually it became apparent to the German Navy that, um, that, that if, 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 Interdicting British supply lines was the best they could do in terms of contributing to the war effort. They would have to be released from the strictures of the prize rules to be really effective in taking out British merchant ships. This is early in the war, and Winston Churchill, first sea lord, is in is in correspondence with Admiral Jellicoe, who commands the fleet. And Ed and Norman's book quotes from this. What they're looking for is genuine anti-submarine warfare defense. And it comes down to pretty practical-minded nets, booms, and minefields. Those were their first thoughts. Is that correct, Ed? Yes, that's correct. Uh, nothing very fancy about that. That would have worked about to cut down anybody. Uh, fire ships would have been stopped by nets, booms, and minefields. Fire ships were the great threat of the 18th century. Those wooden fleets were always fearful yeah. of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, of a ship being loaded up with, with combustibles and sent into a sh- uh, a fleeted anchor. So now we come to genuine anti-submarine warfare. Now they have to reinvent invent everything. And one of the joys of Ed's and Norman's book is that I now know where the language comes from, including ASW. 
they first figure out mines. What's the problem with mines? Why are they good? Why are they bad for submarines, Ed? Well, they're good in the sense that um, that if a submarine hits one, it's going to it's pretty much guaranteed to be sunk. Uh, the earliest mines were were relatively ineffective because their mooring mechanisms were insufficient to keep them at the proper distance below the surface. Now, much of this conflict took place in the North Sea, where there's enormous tidal range. So, if you if you moored a, a mine to be just below the surface at uh, at high at low tide, it was it would be um, it would be well, well very very visible, and the other thing and, and and therefore the submarines were quickly able to figure out where the minefields were, and and just uh, maneuver around them, and uh, or in some cases dive deep enough uh, to go below the mines and 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 although likely possibly fouling a cable could pretty much get through unscathed. Um, and it and 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 to and to build up an impenetrable minefield requires a fairly dense uh, uh, pattern of mines, which are, cost a lot of money. And in addition, um, naval warfare is, uh, is is replete with examples of friendly ships being blown up in their own minefields. Uh, so there's a danger to both sides. They also come up with something called the explosive sweep. What is that? Well, the explosive sweep was, a, was an idea of the, basically to tow a, a large explosive charge behind... Uh, a surface ship, a surface escort, and hope that it would somehow uh, snag a submarine. It, it was a totally impractical idea, and I believe only one one submarine was yeah, ever... Yeah, U-8. My, I have, my note from your reporting is that it was U-boat U-8 March 1915, the only one that was hit by this impractical invention. Yeah. But With, remember, at the time... Um, Everybody was kind of swatting around in the dark. The threat was entirely new. It first appeared seriously in World War I, and nobody knew what to do. They, they thought they had to do something, and they tried a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, but inevitably, much of what they tried just wasn't very practical. Right. The three methods they came up with telling their trawler captains, and remember, they have to invent the destroyer. They haven't invented it yet. They're about to. Uh, gunfire, ramming, and explosive sweeps. And we know the explosive sweeps were not successful. Ramming can be if you're in a close contest in close waters. I note that they, they, uh, the, uh, the Royal Navy tried to set up the Dover Patrol. The Dover Strait is the narrowest part of the English Channel. And they had various methods. They had mines. They also put searchlights on the surface because the German submarines are mostly operating on the surface, correct? They can't stay down that long. Their batteries are crude. Yes, they, they try to go through at night on the surface. If, if they knew, if they could avoid the minefields, they would hope to get through at night on the surface. What is surprising to me from Ed's book is to learn how completely the Germans invented this process while the war is going on. They don't come to this understanding that it's going to be the trigger right away for major conflict for the next 40 years. And we'll turn to that. Hunters and Killers, Anti-Submarine Warfare from 1776 to 1943. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Ed Whitman is here. Hunters and Killers is his book with his colleague Norman Palmer. And the book about anti-submarine warfare, we're now in the 1914, where the gentlemanliness is quickly fading away with the massacres on the battlefields in France and also the catastrophe of Gallipoli. The submarine warfare, however, starts as a a chess match between the Royal Navy and the German Navy early on, 14 and 15. And yet they get better at it, and it's because they come up with anti-submarine 
warfare weapons that are effective. The Germans, by the way, had a, my note here says they had about 10 or 11 boats any one month in the first 26 months of the war. And then in the second half of the war, they went to 45 boats. So they became extremely much more effective at sinking hundreds of thousands of tons of supplies for the United Kingdom, which in the first war and again in the second war is always vulnerable to being cut off from its food supply. It needs to import so much from the United States and from elsewhere. And so the Germans saw that their weapon of cutting off the United Kingdom was going to strangle their ability to sustain the war, unless, of course, the Royal Navy could stop them. Admiral Jellicoe forms an anti-submarine division in December of 1916, so 100 years old for anti-submarine warfare. And they finally come up with a depth charge. It took them a while, Ed. I mean, it seemed kind of obvious that you should want to blow the subs up. Uh, What was their first thinking about the depth charge? Could this do it by itself, and how were they going to deliver it? Well, at first, they were just going to roll it off the back of a ship. Uh, In some cases, they might try dropping from airplanes. Uh, At first, they used a a system, I believe, where they had a lanyard that required, you know, you'd you'd, you'd throw the thing overboard with a length of cable attached, and and when it got to the end of the cable, it would pull the pin. Uh, This wasn't very effective. And and in addition, the, the size of the explosive charge wasn't really sufficient to have a large damage radius. Eventually, they got the idea of um, of triggering the uh, the depth charge by a hydrostatic method. It would get to a certain depth, and then um, and then explode. It, it took a while also for them to learn that uh, you couldn't just roll one off the stern and hope that it got to the submarine. You had to you know deploy patterns of these, and the more the better, so that you could saturate an area and have a larger chance of damaging the submarine. Um, And again, as I say, the explosive charges got bigger and bigger as the war progressed. The U.S. Navy is credited with one sinking, U-58, south of Ireland, 17 November 1917. What's important here is that the U.S. Navy got involved, and why? The German high command decided that the war would go in their favor if they could cut the United Kingdom off. And that required what they called unrestricted submarine warfare. They make that announcement early in 19. 17. That becomes the predicate for Woodrow Wilson to reverse himself, too proud to fight, to join in with the Allies. Now, what I didn't realize until reading Ed's and Norman's book is that the Germans debated this the whole time. And were ve- there was a school that said, let's do it now, let's cut them off, and we'll win in the next six months. They'll starve, we'll launch an offensive in 17 and overwhelm them. There was another school saying, No, the Americans will come in and they'll resupply everything and we won't be able to defeat them. So do I read correctly, Ed, that this was a balancing act between uh, for the German Navy and that they they knew a clock was running and they had to be able to hold off the Americans for such a length of time and they weren't able to do it. The anti-submarine warfare and the convoying system. Uh, won the first war. Is that is that is that too big of a statement here, Ed, that the convoys and the anti-submarine are the major factors for the victory in 1918? I would say certainly that convoying was the most important factor. Um, toward the end of the war, when it was uh, with American support, it was possible to throw more and more ships into the fray. Uh, that had a large effect also. But uh, I say convoying, you know, and, and, you, and uh, in the book there are, there are graphs of uh, the ship losses uh, right. as a function of time and you can see immediately when convoy convoying started down goes the graph you know so uh, i'd say convoying was the most important thing and the convoy system it was hampton roads new york sydney that's in nova scotia or halifax and then all the way to ireland and there was a zone out there about 3 to 500 miles off of ireland which was the area where the germans were going to be most damaging. And the UK, United Kingdom had to invent uh, ships that we can now call destroyers or escort destroyers. All of a sudden, they put them together almost automatically because they had to now fight genuine anti-submarine warfare. What I have from my notes, Ed, is we have the flower class from the United Kingdom. We have the Eagle boats from Ford. That's the United States Navy. We have the P-class escorts. Those are mini destroyers 
from the UK. And then we have a series of further developments of destroyer classes after the war. So at this point, this is the heyday, uh, it occurs to me, of anti-submarine warfare when they're building all these ships just to defeat the submarine. Well, you've got to recall that originally the destroyer was something intended for a different role. It was really intended as a uh, as an adjunct to the large uh, uh, battle fleets that were 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 active at that time, intended to defend the battle line against um, against smaller torpedo boats. Um, they were heavily armed, very fast, um, rather expensive to run, and at the time it was it was felt that uh, they were a little bit. Too, uh, too, too much of an overkill for anti-submarine warfare. So a concerted attempt was made to build a larger number of smaller ships that were suited specifically for ASW, uh, and, and and so allow the destroyers to continue with their 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 battle fleet role. And the U.S. kind of followed suit with the Eagle boats, but they were never quite as successful as the British escorts. They were Te- too small. Technology is important here. Three pieces of technology. First of all, uh, underwater te- uh, detection, uh, also intercepting uh, radio messages. That comes to cryptoanalysis, cryptography, uh, the famous Room 40 at the old Admiralty, Admiralty building. I want to concentrate on two pieces of technology that we will recognize today. One is sonar, called sonar. One is called radar. And these are being invented in the between the war period. They start in the war, but they're between the war period. And Ed, finally, you've solved it for me. ASDIC. I could never figure out what it was an acronym for. It's not. They invented it to, to, to mask what they were really up to. What is ASDIC? Well, ASDIC is active sonar. And I think it's important to understand the difference between passive sonar and active sonar. Uh, passive sonar really consists of just putting a microphone in the ocean. It's called a hydrophone in that context, and listening. Active sonar is more elaborate. That, in, that requires you to send a, a, a short pulse of sound into the water, and then you listen for an echo or reflection from a target that might be out there. Active sonar, or echo ranging, um, had begun to be experimented with just at the end of the war, first in France and then later in England. And it was, but it was only in, in, in the 1920s and 1930s that it really was developed into a fairly effective um, um, ASW measure. I might quickly add that the, the passive stuff that they tried in World War I was relatively unsuccessful. Relatively few submarines were detected and sunk using just passive listening devices. We need to name two men. Uh, first, a Frenchman, Paul Langevin, who developed and is buried in the Pantheon because he was considered a, a great hero for the French. He spent most of the Second War in, under arrest uh, because he was anti-fascist. The Vichy government arrested him. And the other is Dr. Robert William Boyle in the United Kingdom. He also developed ASDIC. And it's the same thing you'll see in Hollywood movies, uh, in a movie such as The Hunt for Red October, which was a famous movie from the Cold War and could be coming back any moment now, to to hear at long distances a distinctive sound, uh, sound waves that you can bounce off of. It's the whole idea of listening to active sonar is that skill set for the drama of submarines. Um, we also need to flag that there was a slower but important development of anti-submarine warfare from aircraft that started with the rigid airships in the first war and continues through the in the interwar period. In fact, if I, they spent a lot of money on this, Ed, did, were, did they regard it as money well spent, land-based uh, f- flying boats? Well, yes. I mean, the use of aircraft in... in in, in warfare started with the First World War, and, and, and it had extended to its earliest uses in anti-submarine warfare. Um, in fact, only a very small handful of, of, of submarines were killed during the First World War by aircraft. But one important function that they did do was that by, by, by flying a, a lot of airplanes back and forth over a, a given area, even if they weren't armed, you could keep the submarines submerged and thereby run down their batteries and make their 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 uh, their attacks much less effective, their patrolling much less effective. So, in that sense, I think people felt that the aircraft were were very useful, 
if only because they could be used to keep submarines submerged, because the submarines were terrified of aircraft. Even though there wasn't a real threat, they were really scared of aircraft. And, and so they, whenever they got any sign of what one was in the area, they'd submerge, which cut their speed, cut their range, and, and minimized their opportunities for finding targets. I was struck the other day doing a story about Guadalcanal, how when we put our battle fleet off in the early days, August of 42, when there wasn't a Japanese fleet to go find, the SBWs, the dive bombers, would get up and go looking with their weapons. They would go looking for Japanese submarines on the surface. They loved to strafe them, Ed. It was, it was a major entertainment for the air wing. Yeah. Uh, but that's many years ahead. We need to get to the Second War. So we're going to turn to the Germans and their preparation, this time under the Hitlerites, to launch a major, major attack in the United Kingdom using submarine warfare under an admiral named Dernitz, and how the British at first are staggered to fight off submarines with anti-submarine warfare. The book is Hunters and Killers, Anti-Submarine Warfare from 1776 to 1943. Edward Whitman is with me. Norman Palmer is his, his, his colleague and co-author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Edward Whitman and I are inventing, because the language was invented, anti-submarine warfare from the birth of America, September 1776, just a few months after the Declaration of Independence, to the beginning stages of the Second War. There's much more fighting in the Second War. There are advances in anti-submarine warfare. But the Germans hit the British with a known weapon, but they overwhelmed them very early on, and they cut them off. And they cut off America and they sink merchant ships in sight of New Jersey. It frightens the Americans. It's part of the Nazi aura that they cannot be stopped, that they have these effective long-range submarines. Hitler orders January 1938, four aircraft carriers, ten huge battleships. That's the Bismarck is one of those. Pocket battleships, light cruisers. But down here, he wants 27 long-range U-boats, 62 short-range U-boats. They intend to use the U-boats under Admiral Dernitz. Eventually, Dernitz wants 300 of them he, to overwhelm the British, to cut them off, to starve Britain to the peace table, to surrender. Early in the war, uh, Ed and Norman bring our attention to three German U-boat aces, Gunter Preen, jo- Joachim Schepke, and Otto Kretschmer. That's U-47, U-100, and U-99. Each of them were responsible as of mid-1940. Remember, they'd only been fighting for a year at this point. The war starts late August, uh, August, uh, September 1939. Each of them were responsible for about 250,000 tons. Ed, these were terrifyingly effective U-boat captains. Did it overwhelm ASW? Given all the preparation they'd been, given the fleet that they'd built, were they, were the, did the UK believe, that the Royal Navy believe that it was inadequate at this point? Well, they certainly learned quickly that it was inadequate. Uh, During the 1930s, after ASDIC had been pretty well invented, as we used to say active sonar, they had enormous confidence that 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 had solved the ASW problem, that they could always find a submarine uh, beneath the surface. But the German tactics uh, were very cleverly designed by Dönitz to to, uh, minimize the effectiveness of ASDIC, and in particular, it didn't work as well as the British thought it did. Um, actually, by attacking on the surface at night, uh, um, they were pretty much invulnerable to ASDIC because you have to be submerged to be detected by that. In addition, um, I think the the, uh, the Brits put too much confidence in the effectiveness of the coastal command of the Royal Air Force, which was really charged with airborne ASW at the time. They were almost totally ineffective against uh, German submarines uh, until about 1942 or three, and 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 so 
the British were over, I think, were overconfident about their ability to meet the threat and soon discovered that their clock was being cleaned. And the convoy system, it was also ineffective early in the war. Why? What 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 changes did the German ma- Germans make? Was it the wolf pack? What uh, or was it their was it their ability to penetrate the uh, allies uh, intelligence gathering? I know the allies were spying on them. Were they also did they also have good spotters on our uh, on our convoys leaving Nova Scotia? Well, um, they had broken the the Allied convoy code. I see. And so they had the Germans had broken the Allied convoy code, and, and and they could they could they had very good advance information about when and where the convoys were going to be. And again, early in the game, Dernitz's wolf pack tactics were very effective. Um, the other thing to remember is that um, in early 1942, after the U.S. Navy or the U.S. joined the war after Pearl Harbor. Uh, It was very reluctant to institute convoying off the east coast of the United States. And at that time, the Germans, you know, sank enormous numbers of ships, as you say, off the coasts of of the eastern seaboard uh, until they were prevailed upon largely by the British to begin convoying regularly. There were terrible losses there. And uh, again, experience and numbers count. And. The numbers were growing, experience was growing, but it took it took two or three years for it to be to bring fruit. Let's go to those three German aces: uh, Gunter Prien, U forty seven, two hundred forty four thousand tons. This is March nineteen forty. He uh, long was believed to have been destroyed as he attacked a, a convoy off of Ireland. But you now have uh, strong evidence that he sank himself. How did he do that? Uh, a circular running torpedo, as I recall, that was a com- fairly common problem. Uh, and I, I think at least two American submarines in the Pacific were lost that way. Um, you know, for some reason, there's a technical fault, and the, the torpedo, instead of uh, streaking toward the target, goes into a circular course that brings it right back to the launching ship. Are you 100? That's Shepka. He is rammed by the uh, the escort Vanek. Ramming, that means that they caught them on the surface. That's bad captaining or maybe a very brave Royal Navy commander. Well, as I recall, that uh, that encounter, it happened at night, and, and it was common practice, normal practice, for the German uh, U-boats to attack on the surface at night um, uh, because they could not be detected by, by, by uh, ASDIC when they were on the surface, and they were, of course, hard to see. And uh, and could maneuver much more, um, much more, more readily. Um, and I, I think it, it just it just got to be a, a very close encounter where uh, perhaps the uh, submarine you know surfaced very quickly, not knowing the destroyer was there, and 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 they the uh, destroyer skipper rammed. It was a perfectly legitimate tactic. And there there were several instances, or were several instances where. A destroyer or another escort rammed a submarine, and and both ships sank because right. so much damage was done to the to the. Finally, the, uh, Captain escort. Captain Kretschmer, who's very famous, U ninety nine, two hundred eighty two thousand tons destroyed. He comes up against Commander McIntyre of the uh, uh, Royal Navy Walker, and Walker does use Aztec to 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 find U ninety nine, and U ninety nine and McIntyre go into a death match. And Walker is victorious, and Kretschmer is captured. I guess he spends the rest of the war in a POW camp, which is why he survived the war. But once those three aces were gone, did that give? Did that bolster the Royal Navy with those three gone out of the war by forty-one? Well, I think uh, they they certainly felt a a certain euphoria, but uh, but there were a lot more. Uh, submarine skippers where those three came from and 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 the worst was yet to come right the worst is yet to come because what winston churchill calls the battle of the atlantic the battle of the north atlantic begins in earnest once the u.s gets into the war and as norman and his colleague norman and his colleague edward whitman point to the fact the big learning curve is for the u.s navy in 42 and 43 how close was it there were statements all during 42 that unless and until we stop this, Great Britain will starve to death. The short rations in Great Britain through 42, 
42, 43, 44, were not just because they were being careful and wanted food for the troops. It was because there wasn't enough food. That was the submarines and only the anti-submarine warfare stopped it. Hunters and killers. 